Welcome to the We Are Libertarians 2020 Presidential Series. I am your host, Hody Johns, and I am joined by uh, the, the, the new, newest and latest, greatest, of course he would tell you, hat the in the model. ring, yeah. <laughs> uh, William Hurst. William, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Great. Thanks for joining me. Sorry I missed you for this long. I'm glad I'm going to get this in before the debate so everybody will have a chance to meet you before, uh, before you hit the main, the main show that everybody's looking forward to. Oh, yes, the debates. Yeah, the debates. The, uh, now, I look forward to the one-on-ones. Uh, the debates are easy for me because I get a question, and it takes me 30 seconds to ask it, and then you guys spend five hours, you know, on uh, providing the actual substance. Those are easy. That's a vacation for me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but the one-on-ones are a little more engaging for me. Um, well, let's, let's just jump right into it. Uh, same questions for every candidate. Again, this is just for my, my listeners. This is so that everybody can get where you stand and compare you and an apples and to apples comparison with the other candidates. And that's why all the questions are the same. Uh, for those who... And, and many candidates, by the way, William, have asked to, for a variety of questions. They want the curveballs. They want the fastballs. They want, they, <laughs> they, they, they want to not know what hits them. That is coming. We've got a series of 10 debates coming up uh, biweekly, or uh, I guess every other week. Is that biweekly or is that is biweekly twice a week? Whatever. Every other week is biweekly. Yeah, okay. Every other week. Biweekly, then, we'll, we'll have some debates, and those are going to contain some really tough questions. So, for now, let's just start it off nice and easy. Our very first question, uh, nice and simple. Tell us who you are. Tell us about you, and please, no politics. This is the only question that doesn't have politics. So, just tell us about your family, job, um, how you came to be, who you are, personality traits, whatever you feel like talking about. All right. Uh I am family ori- I'm a family oriented guy that is usually described as a big kid myself. Uh, <laughs> if my kids are doing laser tag, you can best believe that I will be running around with them. Uh, I am a peaceful and easygoing person, but never think that the reason I'm peaceful is because I forgot how to be violent. Uh, I kind of have that duality there. Uh, what usually works best when describing myself is that I'm a free thinker and a maker. I love learning new things and it heavily shows through my work experiences and and areas of research. The people around me can regularly find me tinkering with some new project or creating something useful from random junk that I find around the house. Uh, I have been, and you said work history, uh, but this is a long list. An (laughs) army medic, disc jockey, radio show host, Digital security, audio engineer, server, a well driller, carpenter, burger flipper, electronics repairman, appliance repairman, computer repairman, web programmer, graphic designer, and a few more things that I don't have listed. <laughs> I, I've been around the block as far as jobs go. I like doing different things. Uh, I try to understand and see things on a fundamental level, and I am one of the people that aren't extremely proficient in an area, any area, but I have a semi-detailed understanding of many things. Uh, because of this, I'm a person that can think outside of convention, and I usually apply this in my personal life. Uh, I'm a person that is personally conservative and socially liberal. Hopefully that's not crossing your border of, of politics. Uh, <laughs> I can be very withdrawn in study and thought. Or I can be a social butterfly. It just depends on the day and location. Uh, I like doing impersonations and joking around. I don't play the saxophone, but I do like playing guitar and singing. Uh, I'm getting to interview Bill Clinton today. Awesome. (laughs) All right. Uh, Hopefully you don't ask me uh, questions on certain topics. (laughs) Uh, just as long as you never have to explain that you never uh, had sexual relations with somebody, I, 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 am, I, I think we'll be okay with your candidacy. <laughs> uh, well, I have had a bit of an eventful and rough life, uh, but I have learned from every pitfall along the way, and I adapt. I have been well off and extremely poor. Uh, Realistically, I can go on about this all day, but 
the full about me and my history would take so long that a friend of mine and author Julian has suggested that I do a biography. I really don't think you'll make much off of that just yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much it about myself. You're all right. You know what? Uh, now that we're getting into the politics, I'm sure if you get elected president, the biography could be worth a little bit more than uh, might might well, do a little. That's why I said just yet. <laughs> might sell a little bit more than what you thought it would beforehand. Um, all right. Well, then let's get into it. Let's talk about your liberty journey. You know, there's so few libertarians that are born into it. Most of them are, have studied it or had some experience that brought them there. What What's your journey towards the liberty, the libertarian movement? The you know, getting your brain in the liberty zone. Uh, uh, it starts in my freshman year of high school. Uh, I was a key to myself atheist, uh, since, since middle school, basically. And I wore a nice leather trench coat because I kind of like the, uh, Matrix movie. Well, one day I was taken into the office by police because it was falsely claimed that I had a copy of the anarchist cookbook. Uh, and they said that I was going to bomb the school. So I was searched, my home was searched, I was held in handcuffs for the, majority, for the majority of the day, and in the full view and ridicule of my classmates. Um, afterwards, the anarchist juniors and seniors welcomed me in. They talked about the utopia of a country free of government control and the issues similar to what happened to me in computer class. The easiest way to describe them would be full and cap black hats without any concept of a non-aggression principle. Uh, this became my view of anarchy, really. Uh, I was, by my free thinking nature, in for the ride, but I had my reservations in the approach and could never fully side with their pursuits. So I disassociated myself from them once I realized the cruel nature of their ideas. And I guess today their ideas might be called domestic terrorism. Uh, yet my free thinking and anarchist views were still present regardless of how they portrayed it. 9-11 uh, happened and my position of anarchy took an immediate change in favor of the state and protecting those around me. I joined the military soon after where conservatism was a big thing. It was said many times that we are protecting capitalism and freedom, yet the free thinker in me has to question this. And after the military, I started learning about, I started learning about our country's history and started paying attention to what our government was doing. Uh, the more I did, the more I started siding with my democratic friends and their pursuits, uh, especially after becoming poor myself and realizing there were no real options present for myself outside of social programs that I refused to take part in. Uh, I was regularly arguing their views and their means to an end is not truly being equality or freedom, but a superiority of their ideas, limiting conservatives and their views while conservatives did the same. And I wasn't willing to pick any kind of sports team to fight and win over the other. So by 25, I was none of the above, left or right, and I was stuck fighting for ideologies that were in between both of them from the perspective of the Constitution, freedom, and peace. Uh, in 2012, I was introduced to libertarianism and the LP by a coworker. His method of explaining it was that, was that of absolute anarchy much like what I had seen from the people in high school. Uh, my initial thought was, no way would I ever side with a group of people that are grown up high school anarchists. Uh, the same applied when I looked into online chat rooms. And it wasn't until 2000, the 2016 election, when I heard Johnson's approach, that my view of the LP start, view of the Libertarian Party started to change not directly due to his ideas and actions, but the ability to allow, uh, yeah, excuse me, the ability to allow free thought in a party, and that changed my perspective. Because of that, 
and through this whole Trump conundrum, I started uh, looking at the party more and realized the underlying principles were nothing like what I had seen by the outspoken and aggressive libertarians who spent more time culling the impure and bashing outsiders than welcoming them in to learn. Uh, I was made fully aware of the NAP along with the full gamut of libertarianism. Uh, because of this, last year I finally decided to join a political party for the first time, and that was the, uh, the Libertarian Party, the only party that even closely matched my views. Since then, getting to know more and more sensible people who all think on the path towards freedom and are against harming others for gain by varying means, various means. Uh, what I didn't know until recently is that my entire life has been spent within the libertarian spectrum. So maybe my journey hasn't been towards libertarianism so much as it's been a journey as a libertarian. Awesome. They, you know, it, that's a very unique story. I think uh, it's, it's, there's some terrible experiences in there, but also some experiences that are good that you had because you came to some realizations that some of us don't come to until a lot later in life. I know yeah. uh, it's great. You recognize none of the above by 25. I think I was still, pro. <laughs> I think I was still like pro Iraqi occupation in 2005. I mean, it was, well, the, the none of the above part was more due to having kids. I, I had my first kid at 25. Well, okay. I didn't have it, but <laughs> my kids yeah, didn't have it. <laughs> I see. And, you, you know, you really don't have to worry about stuttering either. I tell people all the time I'm a professional talker, and you still hear me say um and like and things that we all try to delete from our language. Stuttering is no biggie. Uh, we, I used to have this friend that would constantly, um, and we used to count on our fingers every time he would say five sentences, how many times he said, um, I wrap myself on the fingers uh, when I say, um, or, uh, and I have some, I have some bad looking fingers as a result of it. I'm too, we're, we're working on it. Uh, all right. Well, let's, let's pretend we're going to work backwards. We're going to start pretending you're president. And then we're going to take a step back and try to get you through an election. And then we're going to stay, take a step back and try to get you through the primary. So let's right. start off. We got President William Hurst, a uh, very presidential sounding name. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about your three biggest problems facing America and how you fix them. So uh, just in order, let's start with what you believe the biggest problem facing America is and what the William Hurst solution is to that problem. Okay. Well, as president, I'm somewhat limited in the scope of my abilities. Like Ms. Ruff, I understand the abilities of the position and that you have to work within a set of parameters to accomplish any goal. I will have to work with Democrats and Republicans to solve our issues in a way that includes libertarian ideas, rather than taking an authoritarian approach. Because yes, I will say this, even if we are pursuing libertarian ideology, it would be authoritarian to force our position on anyone. That being said, thank you for voting me into office and I will get started on working towards solutions immediately. My first and biggest issue, the first and biggest issue that I have noticed is corruption. This seems to play a key role in the majority of the issues we come across. It will be my goal to reduce the effect it has on our democratic republic. One of the many ways I plan on fixing this issue is by first being transparent myself and showing the people what that means by example. If I veto a bill, I want people to know exactly why I did that. On top of this, I will not overlook any pursuit by a lobbyist or any other to influence the law for personal gain and the personal gain of a government official. This is bribery, plain and simple. It will be a staple of the FBI under my presidency to investigate any source of corruption. I will work alongside members of Congress that wish to end or hamper this issue that affects us all. So that way we can return the government to the people. Awesome. The, you know, the, 
I, I, and I know you're, I think you're going to be the last interview. I don't know. We'll see who else throws their hat into the ring, but I haven't heard the others say corruption. Uh, at least definitely not at number one. Uh, uh, well, that affects every facet of government from top to bottom. And it is one of the underlying parts, uh, one of the underlying issues that uh, basically spans the entirety of everything that we have to deal with as far as yeah. government goes. No, it's great. I think I w I'm pretty sure all of the candidates would agree with you that it's important. I just don't think any of them put it at, at number one like you did. But the uh, that's that's uh, that's awesome, and I see why you did. All right, well, if you take that one down. You yeah. also help every other goal after the fact. Sure, I I totally understand. You're you're you fix corruption, and that that goes across all departments. That goes across all you know every federal aspect. I mean that at least uh, that you can control. Absolutely. Uh, let's take a look at problem number two and how you would uh, how you would attack that. Uh, this is one that I'm surprised hasn't been done already. And this may be due to corruption. This is waste. We waste a lot of money federally. Does anybody even know how much? There are ballpark guesses, but nobody really has a clue. Uh, I plan on commencing a full audit of the executive branch in my first year. With the results of this audit, I hope to be able to pinpoint areas that we can save money by simply not wasting it. By doing this, we can help reduce our debt, repair infrastructure, reduce taxes. Really, this would free up a lot of possibilities on a scale that will become more evident as the audit progresses. Cool. Uh, audits are always uh, always good. Any plan on, uh, how, I mean, do you make that independent? Nobody trusts government audits anymore. What is that audit? Well, like? that, would, that would have to be an independent audit. Okay. So it would have to be a source that is set up outside of, well, issue number one, corruption. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, because the audit would realistically be skewed if it was allowed to be done by anybody, anybody that could be influenced by money. Yeah. So it'd be really difficult to set it up to begin with. But once it's in place and once it's going, it will give a basic full view of everything that needs to be done as far as financially. And it may actually, it may actually give a hint to areas where money is being spent that shouldn't be spent uh, in a very immoral way. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, the Department of Defense had one audit in the last 15 years. And we found out they lost a trillion dollars from their only audit. So it's like... I know. We should probably and, do this more often. <laughs> I mean, all these people talking about the healthcare stuff. Well, where would that trillion dollars have gone? Yeah, I wonder. All right, um, problem number three, and how would you address it? Um, common sense. It is a broad issue, but it does affect everything. Uh, and we seem to have an inability to approach issues in a way that use common sense. Uh, <laughs> By this, I mean in a way that doesn't solve an issue by creating other serious issues. Uh, the war on drugs, for example. It is loosely regarded as a, means, as a means to protect the people, yet it funds organized crime and our prison population is predominantly filled with people on drug charges. Uh, I think common sense would say that maybe if, uh, if the lives lost due to fighting drug operations and the lives that become ruined by prison sentences outnumber the lives saved by this fight, the war should end. Um, fighting climate change globally based on evidence, it makes sense. Deregulating emissions doesn't. Uh, not allowing people to donate directly to government programs and reduce the necessity for taxes also makes no sense. Uh, I have seen recently that I've seen recently Bill Gates discussing this in, on an interview. Him and his wife want to be able to directly contribute to government programs. And this would greatly reduce the need for taxes and be a step 
in the direction of reducing or completely eliminating uh, the income tax altogether. So basically, if you're stuck saying to yourself, this doesn't make sense, it is like an is likely an issue that I am or I will be working on. Yeah, we, we, With common sense. <laughs> oh yeah, we on the network have talked about, uh, we're trying to change the dialogue a little bit, especially for outsiders. I think just the name We Are Libertarians gets a lot of people on the ground level and, and we don't pretend that it's anything, you know, anything, but that we're aware actually, that the name is how I actually found y'all. <laughs> right. It, that's, that's kind of our first stop, you know, a lot of libertarians first stop. And so we don't want to scare people off and we want to bring them in. And one of the things we're trying to do is talk about how we're not against healthcare. We're against mandated government forced, government coerced healthcare. And yeah. so when all you do is spend all day railing against healthcare, there are people that use it and they're like, well, I need healthcare. That that's not going away, you know. So uh, that's good to to talk about. You know, the ability to voluntarily donate to those programs, I think, is is pretty critical. And that would that would help lead to a more libertarian outlook on those things because people say people say that you know uh, donating, you know. Uh, let me find the words for this real quick. No, you're all right. Uh, that uh, basically donations and uh, not pro non for profit uh -huh. uh, that they can take over a lot of the healthcare things in place of government, but we can't get anybody in Congress to take that unless it is proven. Yeah. So even yeah. if they were being completely sensible about everything you still have to have a proof of concept. Yeah. And we don't have that yet. Sure. All right. Well, I hate to do this to you, but we're going to take away your presidency. We're going to go oh, back. Come on. <laughs> Already? <laughs> we're going to get you through an election now. Um, so you were, we're assuming again, you've, you've won our primary. We're going to talk about how you'll win that later, but and, and I tell all the interviewees this, even if you take every single libertarian vote, they all show up to the polls. I mean, tops, you're looking at like 15% of the vote. If every libertarian voter shows up, you're going to have to pull from Republicans, Democrats, and the people who aren't interested in voting entirely because they're turned off by politics. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about your appeals and we're going to start socially. So let's talk about social liberals and their concerns. A lot of times they are worried about, um, they're worried about, I mean, handicap access, social justice. You've got uh, issues where they see um, the, 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 especially the color war going on um, in their communities. How would you appeal to them more than the democratic candidates that claim to be their champions? Um, these are basically the progressives, right? Yeah, the, socially, social progressives. We'll get to the we'll get to the fiscal progressives in a different question. Yeah. Uh, the biggest thing I think progressives they, they would like would be my approach to equality. I don't side on equality in a way that tries to just exchange dominance from one hand to the next. Uh, I believe. Equality comes with the same benefits and pitfalls as everybody else. Uh, I also think that universal health care and free education are important goals. Uh, these liberals are very like-minded to the majority of my stances on peace and open-mindedness to new ideas, along with the elimination of corruption. So I've noticed that this area is specifically the area that takes the biggest stance against corruption yeah. more in an aggressive way, but sure. Yeah. But uh, no, important to pull them in. Now let's, uh, let's talk about the other side of the aisle and the social conservatives. They've got, they're worried about their traditional values. Uh, marriage is getting a road on churches are losing their rights. Um, family values seem to be getting torn down. What would you offer to a social conservative that is worried about their way of life? That that wouldn't be represented by whoever the I mean, it will probably be Trump. He may likely won't get primaried, but you know, Trump or Weld or whoever the Republican is. 
Why you uh, instead of them? Well, my appeal here really depends on the extremes in their direction, in this direction. Uh, if anyone thinks that I'm going to allow a law, excuse me, if anyone thinks that I'm going to allow a law to pass my desk that tries to implement a religious based constraint on others against their will and against our constitution, they're sadly mistaken. For the extreme evangelicals, this will assure I have absolutely no appeal to them. However, this is where the extremes part comes in. Uh, those who are not so extreme, this could be appealing since the same veto and mindset could also protect their religious freedom. That's uh, the power of the veto has protected many a right because most of the things that come across legislators desks, let's face it, are restriction of rights. And, yeah. uh, uh, and that's are... where I have an actual position to be able to say, no, you're not taking away somebody's right. Yep. Awesome. Uh, let's talk economy now. Let's start with the economic left and those progressives we talked about earlier. They see a wage gap. They see uh, rich getting richer, poor getting poorer. They're worried about we've got poverty. We've got the corporates getting the getting welfare, and yet people are having struggling to get their food stamps. Why would they vote for you instead of whoever the liberal candidate is? Um. Well, this may be the hardest group to appeal to. Uh, people in this area tend to be all in Democrats. Uh, without being dishonest, I couldn't promise them the 500 or or $1,000 a month they want. Uh, if they take me on honesty and positions towards health care and education, there may be some appeal uh, outside of that. I don't see much appeal unless I'm lying to them and I will not lower myself to lie. Andrew Yang would be so dip disappointed that you can't offer a thousand dollars a month to him, but you know, that, that, that's the Democrat. So uh, that's their, their issue. I guess he's going to back up his words. Uh, all right. Let's talk about the economic conservatives. They're sick of seeing the scope of government grow. Uh, usually they're concerned about every department besides defense that they just want to see shrink. They want to make sure that the defense still gets their funding though. And they're really protective over businesses. Right. How would you be more appealing to an economic conservative than whoever the Republican would be? Uh, this is basically where we get the majority of the uh, party conversions from that side uh, for the LP party. Mm -hmm. Um, I think my idea of a full audit and my stances on reducing waste and government intervention would be attractive to them. Uh, yeah, basically, the way I would handle finances would be extremely, extremely uh, attractive for economic conservatives. Yeah. Okay. Um no, uh, now I got to even take the take that away from you. We're going back down to the primary, and we're going to get you on a stage with, at the moment, uh, eight other guys. I think nine total hats in the ring, uh, and we're going to talk about how you're going to appeal to the libertarians enough to survive this nomination. So let's start with the different parts of the Libertarian Party. We've got let's start with the left. Um, some guys I'm close to. We got the Libertarian Socialists, of course. You got the Mutualists over there. Um, you got the, you know, Mike Shipley and and Matt Kino and all them and and everybody who's interested in kind of that voluntary style social structure, business horizontal business structure. Um, why would they be interested in what in you more than any of the other candidates on the stage? Um, well since I'm basically talking to them here, uh, I'm not afraid, <laughs> I'm not afraid to take a socialistic stance on something that would be better handled by it. To me, it makes no sense not to have a choice of all the cards at play. Uh, and unlike many others, I will actually hear your ideas out. I fully understand that social, uh, that the socialism that many others fear is not the brand you represent. 
uh, their fears are based off of dictatorships that used it to control the population. And all this being said, and answering the next question as well, uh, speaking to both the left and right, socialism and capitalism shouldn't be an idea of extremes that a president chooses. Uh, the position requires a neutral stance on this. I cannot provide championship of either side, but I can assure that both are looked at equally on their merits. Uh, I represent liberty and personal choice, something that both the left and right can agree on. If you want someone who will consider your positions all of the time over the gamble of electing someone that will not represent you at all, I'm your man. <laughs> that, I, I appreciate you addressing them directly. Well, I get, I, did you cover the libertarian writers? There's some more message that yeah. you would like to give yeah. them. Uh, the, well, there's the understanding there that I'm considering all sides of the spectrum. Uh, you know, I'm not going to ditch the left and I'm not going to ditch the right. I'm going to hear both sides out equally, but it is not my position as a president or as a would be president to take up single positions on economic ideas. Gotcha. Well, you've got the left to right on the, the spectrum, but maybe the bigger word with libertarians is the up and down. So let's talk about them real quick. Let's start with the, <laughs> yep. the furthest down. Let's talk about the, the anarchists, um, anarchists and caps and comms and whatever is anything anarchy. Much of the time, these people even don't even want to vote for you if they are worried about you even potentially leaving government intact afterwards. So what would be your appeal to an anarchist? Well, I'm not a suit. Uh, I am a free thinker. And I know y'all want a world with no government control, but without your support for the right candidates, you're realistically helping our country slowly progress towards more control. My goal is to bring the government in your direction. Maybe not to the extent that you wish. However, if you want any direction away from authoritarianism, we all need to stand together as individuals, and this includes you. Your protest of the government includes your vote. Unless you're looking to watch the world burn, getting involved will help in your pursuit far more than an aggravated tweet at 2 a.m. against somebody that's realistically in your corner. That's true. Awesome. Uh, now let's talk about the moderates, the minarchists, the suits, as you say. Uh, a lot of these guys at convention, how do you appease them the best? Um, I can wear a suit and prevent myself from taking my clothes off on stage. Uh, <laughs> I can avoid showing up to an event high or drunk. I don't really drink or do drugs. Um, I can act like a rational adult all of the time uh, while helping promote the party and freedom by providing a responsible example. Great. Um, you're, you're flying through these questions. So let's, uh, let, let's, let's just, let's get blunt here. Why are you the best of all the libertarian candidates that you've heard of that you've seen so far? Why are you the best one? Because I'm me. <laughs> he says if you're listening to this on audio you missed him really flexing on you there uh, the video will be up on youtube or we're libertarians.com go ahead and check it out but uh yeah so uh, pure okay. swag my friend go ahead so i offer a non-abrasive step in the direction of liberty i use logic first and belief second i am not running to promote myself mm -hmm. or to gain money or to force my belief on others in an authoritarian way. Uh, every candidate so far seems to have their isolated focus or pet project. Uh, my project is returning America to the people, all of the people. 
and keeping them safe. So the next generation will look back at today like we do the Wild West. I'm not in it solely to promote libertarianism. I'm in it to win it for the sake of all who are affected by our current progress towards authoritarianism. I don't necessarily want to be president, but somebody has got to at least try. That's a great message. And sometimes the only flag we can ask somebody to carry. Um, let's get to the nuts and bolts here. I, I've worked on a campaign and it is very demanding on the president. Uh, re regretfully, I was working with the Republican at the time, but the, uh, the president was constantly busy. I, I, I will say a lot of bad things about his presidency. I can't say anything bad about his hustle. I mean, the guy was yeah. constantly raising money, constantly visiting places, constantly talking to people. Corporations, you know, making the key routes, had a plan. And I find those nuts and bolts people that understand how these campaigns work are the ones that end up surviving and succeeding in these elections. And the ones who don't are the ones who can't crack, crack 3% and make us look like more of a joke. So do you have a plan in place to raise money and make time all that time that it takes to be president? Um, the time it takes to be president? <laughs> or to run, I guess I should say, to run for president. Well, yes, I, I can take the time it takes to run for president. Uh, but it's the funding that's a complete different ballpark for me. Uh, I know this is common practice, but I'm not here to make or waste money. And I'm not independently wealthy. I think the campaign would be best served by having volunteers do the fundraising and administrative tasks at the start while I commit to reaching more people. Uh, if I lose the nomination, this wastes to other people's money, not my own. And I do have a problem with that. Uh, I have not spent or earned over $80 yet on this campaign. Yet here I, may, here I am spreading my ideas to countless people at no cost on wall. <laughs> uh, I, do I, think, I think between the equipment I've got and the software for it, I've spent over $80 on this campaign already. <laughs> What's yeah, I know. Doing? What am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do realize that it will cost a lot of money to even stand a chance. You know, you have your advertising and everything else. Uh, but I'm not focusing on funds at the moment until I know that I will not be wasting other people's money. But I do have a GoFundMe page set up to take donations. If anybody can help, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if anybody truly wants to help, though, I could definitely use volunteers to help work on the principal campaign from top to bottom. Great. Well, that I mean, that really takes us to that final question. William, people heard you. They're interested in you or not interested in you and really want to tell you about it. How do they get a hold of well, you? They probably <laughs> will. <laughs> <laughs> you know how it is, right? Nine times out oh, of ten, yeah. I look at my inbox after a controversial podcast. I'm like, I am not looking forward to this. Um, <laughs> The, but let's talk about um, how people find you. Where, where is the right place to go? Talk about that GoFundMe, any websites? Where do you want to direct um, people? Where do you want the traffic? Uh, the GoFundMe is actually linked to from my website. That is williamhurstcampaign.org. Uh, you can also contact me there, look me up, or get a hold of me on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is William underscore J underscore Hearst. Uh, outside of that, I usually try to keep my Facebook pretty personal and just with people I know. So I'm not going to give that one out. <laughs> you're good. There's uh, many, many of the candidates that don't even have one. So you're okay. Oh, well. <laughs> oh, here you go. You got a logo and everything. I'm looking at your page. All right. Fantastic. Yeah, right, well, I completely designed and wrote the script for that entire website. Well, I know you didn't pay somebody to do it, right? No, <laughs> so. not with an eighty dollar on the campaign. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe you really shortchanged your graphic designer, gave him like twenty, right? <laughs> no, you're good, man. Well, All if right. There's any graphic designers or if any uh designers want to help with that i'm open <laughs> <laughs> well there you go awesome man well i will uh i will have that link in the show notes so if you're listening and you're interested in seeing him or want to drop by he has he even has a button on the page for questions and answers so if you want to get a hold of him 
Uh, he's got so many, that, many ways for you to do it. That, that link right there is for the emails and some of the better questions I get, I'll leave the answers to on there. Uh, okay. I haven't been doing it recently, but that more takes place on my Twitter. So I'll just put like a question of the day when I get a good question. Okay, cool. You know, I, uh, I extended these invites to the Democratic candidates, and I've got some responses, of course, not from them personally, but from their, uh, their, pre from I, their pre I personally know one of the Democrats that would definitely get on here. Uh, that are running for president? Yes. Oh, uh, sweet. We're, we're actually working somewhat together uh, as far as the whole... Do you want to say that publicly? Think about it real quick. <laughs> well, we're, as far as the Wikipedia issue goes, we're... Okay. They're not allowing people. They're not allowing people any kind of recognition on there, even though they are running for president. Huh. So, in a way, you have to work together with people in order to be able to get that recognition. Okay. I'm not afraid to work with people if it helps. You know, correct something that shouldn't be there. Awesome. Well, you and I will talk about that after I hit the end record button. Uh, <laughs> I don't necessarily want everybody knowing the Democratic uh, whatever, you know. Okay. But I was just going to say, you know, I've, I've been in contact with them and some of them still, they have like their exploratory committee website up yet, but they don't even have their campaign yeah. website up yet. So you're not behind the well, eight I, I've actually been making an effort to look at other candidates and learn about everybody else that is running uh, for 2020. It is ridiculous because there's what, almost six or 700 of people. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I tell you what, uh, if, uh, if presidency doesn't work out, there's always a spot for you in the media if you're willing to do this kind of work. So <laughs> <laughs> just, that just, is not you know, been the first time I've heard that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> just throwing that out there. Well, William, man, it was great to meet you. Uh, I look forward to seeing you just a few days and, and, uh, the debate stage. Um, if you are listening, I appreciate you making it to the end, listening to William Hurst. Again, he's giving you the website. You can find that in our show notes. And thank you for supporting WeareLibertarians.com. Please join our Patreon because that's what makes interviews like this possible for me to keep going so that I can keep doing this and don't have to have 80-hour-a-week jobs to finance my exorbitant lifestyle. So please uh, join our Patreon and uh, share with your friends. I absolutely accept currency that is not actually money so if you would like to pay me in recognition uh share this with your friends throw us up a like or heck even just tell me that you liked it make my day a little bit better i'd really appreciate that but uh thank you again so much william and and i look forward to seeing you later yeah.